Good morning, church. We're 28 days from Easter. It's four weeks. Yes, candy. Yes, baptism. Um, I'm excited about that. We're three weeks from Palm Sunday. We covered that about a month or so ago, but we're three weeks from Palm Sunday. And we are having our first Good Friday service in over a decade, which is amazing. Um, I'd like to encourage you with something. It ties into our passage today, in my opinion. I'd like to encourage you with something. 2% of Christians will actually do what I'm encouraging you to do. I'd encourage you to invite someone you like, some friend, to join you and sit with you at church on Easter. 82% is a stat. 82% of people, when surveyed, said yes, they would go with someone to Easter's service if a friend invited them. So I know a call to all is a call to no one. But I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, bring a friend on Easter. Come on, it's okay. Turn to the person next to you. I don't care if it's your spouse. Say, bring a friend on Easter. So I didn't tell you. Your friend told you to bring a friend on Easter. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're going to have a good time on Easter morning. It, it ties into our passage today. You'll see. Uh, Easter is coming up. Uh, Easter is coming up in the text, but we're not there yet. Not today. Today is the transitional passage between, between Pilate's court and the crucifixion of Christ. Uh, and today's text is often rushed over. And honestly, the first time I saw it, I kind of thought, ah, okay. Uh, that's the beauty of expository preaching. It makes you earn your paycheck as a pastor. It makes you work harder. Uh, but it's been good. It's been good for my soul to dig into this and learn what is going on in this passage and what God might have for us as a church. I've titled this message, Jesus' Last Sermon, which we'll spend the majority of our time looking at here today. And I was thinking about my last sermon. I often think about this in a morbid way or a, you know, a deadline way of what I'm reverse engineering my life towards, I will die and leave you someday. And that's not like a weird, morbid thing. Like, hopefully I don't die on the way home today. But ideally, I envision an old mic saying goodbye. And what will I say on my last sermon? Will I settle scores? Will I tell it like it is? Will I be looser than normal? You're like, Mike's pretty loose already. <laughs> like, what will I be like on my last sermon, knowing it's the last time you hear me as your pastor? Um, and, I, and I look forward to that. Do you get what I'm saying? I'm not like cherishing that day, but I do look forward to that day. I hope to end well. I hope to end on brand. I hope that my sound bites of classic Mike hasn't changed over the years. We get to see Jesus with his sermon on the road to Golgotha, sharing a prophetic, judging, powerful word to the, the mobs around him, the crowd. And it's a serious and solemn passage. And, uh, it's very refreshing to look at. Your, your, it refreshes and enlarges your heart as you see what Christ says in this passage. And so uh, this transitional passage, we see the consistent Christ preaching God's judgment and repentance in this passage. The same consistent Christ that we see at the beginning of Luke, we see in the middle of Luke, and we see here at the end of his earthly ministries. And there's three movements in this text. Um, three movements I propose to you that we should focus on and settle down on as we see what is, Luke is trying to communicate to us today as we look at this passage that Luke wrote. The Cyrene is one of the, the movements. The crowd is the second movement. And the call, what Christ is calling them to. So if you'd bow your heads and let's pray. Let's pray that God would use this time like only he can. Lord, I, I thank you for today. I thank you for uh, the word of God. And I thank you how the word of God is able to do more than we ha ask or imagine. Lord, I ask that the word of God would do the work of God and the people of God. Use the Spirit of God to convict, instruct, encourage us, God. We just, we just need you to show up in a fresh and powerful way. We need you to really use today in a way that is, can be compelling and powerful, Lord. I pray that people would hear from you in the text today. I pray that they would see you in the text. They'd, they'd smell you in the text. They would, they'd see what you care about in the text. Uh, I pray that they would respond to you in the text. And they would respond to you, Christ, with a heart of repentance, Lord. We love you. And we commit today to you, Lord, and our time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, look at me at Luke, Luke 23, verses 26. And as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. The crucifixion is considered a brutal judgment on an occupied people by the Romans occupying forces. And so the Romans would really cluster a group of people together that needed to be crucified at the same time, just as a way of return on investment and man hours of, of manning the people who were being crucified and executed. They would tend to schedule these crucifixions around large Jewish holidays to have the best eyes on what is happening. 
they would want to get the best return on investment by running their this 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 path from where they start to where they finish should only be two thousand some feet. It should take a matter of minutes to walk that path, but instead they historically by tradition in Jerusalem they take some very long roads, uh, walking around the city of Jerusalem, parading a very dark parade about what is happening. It's very likely that the vertical beam of what Christ will be crucified on is already at Skull Hill, Golgotha Hill. The horizontal beam Christ is carrying. And this is after his, his beatings and after his scourging, when his back skin on his back has been predominantly flipped, ripped off through a Roman scourging. Uh, his neck, his shoulders, his lower back has been just throttled through Roman scourging, a whip that would rip pieces of skin off a prisoner's back. And usually scourging would start the bleeding out process for many, many prisoners as they're going to their execution. It was a, it was a brutal, solemn time. You can walk this road in Jerusalem. It's called the Rio de la Rosa. You can walk this road in Jerusalem. There's 14 different movements of Christ carrying the cross. And when he fell and, and what supposedly allegedly happened along that road, which is not in the scripture. But this is the way of sorrow, the Rio de la Rosa. And it is a real thing that happened. And Christ walked through on our behalf towards Golgotha. So in this setting, let's, let's envision around 9-ish in the morning. And he's en route to Golgotha carrying his cross in this dark parade. It should have only taken a few moments, but instead Christ is taking his final steps. His final steps here on his mission on earth of three years of fruitful ministry, of preaching and teaching about the things of God to the nation of Israel. He's taking his final steps on earth of the last hours, his last minutes, his last words on the road to Golgotha, Skull Hill. And in reality, this began long before time began. This began in eternity when this all began. In time before Christ arrived on earth, back in heaven, God preordained this is how God would save mankind. You can see a, a picture of that in the, in the book of Genesis about how God foreshadowed Christ coming to save the nations of Israel and save the world. But the road to the cross began in heaven, not Pilate's court. It began on Christmas, not in Pilate's court. On the road to the cross, we meet many different characters. We meet murderers, strangers. We meet people weeping, curious crowds, companion criminals. We see all sorts of different people on the way to the cross. Usually, people carry their own cross, but because of the strain and the stress and the physical torment that Christ has been through the previous evening, he's running out of stamina. He's running out of strength to carry the cross. And this brings us to our first person we, we I'd like you to focus your attention to on verse 26, the Cyrian. And in this man's short account of what he did and what we see elsewhere in Scripture, the Cyrian responded to the consistent Christ preaching God's judgment and repentance. He responded to Christ. I propose to you he did. He came from a northern Libya city with 100,000 Jews, historians will tell us, lived in that city in northern Libya, Libya. But they, scholars say he probably was not a follower of Christ at this time. He probably was just coming en route to Jerusalem for the religious ceremonies he was going to engage in as a good Jew. But he encountered Christ on the road. And it seemed like he continued to follow Christ, not just on that morning, that road, but on the rest of his life as he went back to his home city of Cyrene. Not much is known about him, but he's called to carry Christ's cross a portion of the way to Golgotha Hill. Mark's account in Mark 15, 21, and Romans 15, 21, and, and Romans 16, 13, we hear about a Simon of Cyrene's sons who became prominent leaders in a church in the city of Cyrene. We hear about Paul referencing the wife of Cyrene, Simon of Cyrene, as like a, a mother in the faith to him. We, if you want to pull on this thread of Simon of Cyrene throughout church history and or the Bible, you'll see how... It seems like a gospel-believing church grew up in that city of northern Libya. And they sent out missionaries to support, uh, preachers to support their church in Antioch. And the church in Antioch sent out Paul on his missionary journey. What I found amazing as he continued to go down that thread, pull on that thread about what seemed like a random moment in this person's life. Walking to not encounter Christ and he encounters Christ. He encounters his dark parade, he encounters all that's going on. That random moment, I challenge you, is not random because of the strategic, brilliant hand of God is at play. And God doesn't do random. God does repentance. 
And this man responded to Christ on the road. He just figuratively and I believe spiritually continued to follow Christ the rest of his life. We, and he saw with the best, most intimate view of what was happening as Christ spoke out the following passage to these, these people. The crowd and Christ's call to the crowd and how they respond or did not respond, Simon of Cyrene saw. He saw the consistent Christ preaching God's judgment and repentance for the nation of Israel. If I, if I want to take this, this main point, we see a consistent Christ preaching God's judgment and repentance and de-church it for you for a moment. I think of that Head and Shoulders commercial. Troy Palomalu and that other quarterback, uh, how he's never not working. It seems like Christ is never not working when he's on, in the text, speaking and preaching about God's coming judgment, how the men and women need to respond to the judgment of God through repentance in him. And Christ is literally walking out what they need to, what they need to believe in and repent from and put their trust in. God's providential hand, his purposes are prevailing. The enemies of God did not win, and, the, and God has continued to play out his plan just like he prefers and desires to do among men and women. But whatever little part of the kingdom of God you think you're writing, God doesn't do random. He does repentant. And if you're a repentant person, you can be a skilled story part of God's story, how he is building his kingdom here on men. God is writing a grand, bold, beautiful, redemptive plan of mankind and God isn't, random isn't random with God, and repentance isn't random with God. And God will use the little we have to offer, the little gestures we can show that we're trying to serve and love and support the cause of Christ in profound ways. I do get choked up at times, especially when talking about my family. My wife is a 12-year-old girl. Grew up in, she was born in Des Moines, grew up in Lincoln and Omaha most of her life. And her family was flying out to Korea to visit some family. And a college girl, sitting next to my wife as a 12-year-old girl, spent hours sharing the gospel with my wife. And then I continued a relationship for years of her writing letters to my wife. My wife responded in repentance several years later. But God uses the random efforts we have. The random things we try to do to serve Christ, to be found faithful, God uses. And God does repent it. Simon of Cyrene is a man who seemed to respond to the consistent call of Christ's preaching on judgment and repentance. Look at me at verses 27. And there followed him a great magnitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. And this masses I would call the crowd. Men and women, my friend was telling me the other day that the average U.S. prisoner who's found guilty spends about 20 years waiting to be executed in the United States. It's 20 birthdays, 20 Christmases, 20 Thanksgivings, 20-ish years of waiting on death row. And he was pointing out that it seems like the distance between the courtroom and the crucifixion, Christ had 20 minutes, 2,000 feet. And this is where we are introduced by Luke to the crowd. And with the crowd, we see a consistent Christ preaching God's judgment, his judgment and repentance. Now, this moody mob is meeting their maker. This curious crowd or this, this speculative masses of people are seeing their Savior face to face and they miss him. I'm speculating that one of the reasons why they're moving so quickly is because this part of the Roman Empire had a lot of revolts, a lot of mob life at this part of the world. They're moving quickly because back in the day, the disciples couldn't just tweet out or text their friends and family saying, they got Christ. They're trying to kill him. Meet me on this street. We're going to get him back. Word spread differently. It spread through word of mouth. There wasn't this device that kept everyone connected 24-7. So as this crowd is there flaunting and taunting Christ, it's not friends and family. It's more like enemies and foes of Christ. And as the world is waking up, the opposition already had a plan in place to get him from A to B to completely finish everything that they're trying to do. 
I imagine this corrupt court and this rushed judgment of Christ. The Romans were worried about a growing mob and riots. And I know this same mob of people loved and celebrated Christ on Palm Sunday, but this is not the same people. I think I can prove that through our passage as we look at the next few verses. There's mourners here. These people, these, these women who are mourning and lamenting for him. You would hire, culturally speaking at that time, you would hire people to lead out in grief and loss for those who are being led to being executed. These three men on the road to Golgotha, you would, lead, you would hire people that would scratch their face, beat their breasts, pull their hair, and lead out by example as the, nation, as the people would grieve and mourn the loss of what was happening. Mary did not hire these mourners. The disciples did not hire these people. The enemies of Christ put things in motion to make this happen to execute their judgment quickly. So what is happening? The enemies of Christ moved fast, and the friends and family woke up to be horrified to find that he was given the death penalty and he was captured overnight. An illegal overnight mourning. There's mourning and there's a verdict given, an unjust verdict, although he's found innocent. And we go to verse 28. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Now this is not Mary and Mary Magdalene and the women you know about in the Bible that supported Jesus' earthly ministries, I propose. These people are from Jerusalem. Those women are predominantly from Galilee. And this is not how you speak to your mom walking to Golgotha Hill. Don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves and your children. We see later on, which we'll get to, how tenderly and kindly Christ speaks to his mom and John as he watches from a distance. I mean, there's a time and a place to communicate to your mother and people who supported your ministry. This is not the same crew of people. These are the professional mourners who arrived. And this is where we are introduced to the call of what Christ is calling them to. Christ is calling these people to repentance one last time. And we'll see here, Jesus pronounces a very strong judgment and prophetic warning to them that they should not feel sorry for him, but sorry for themselves. So why is this happening? Why is Luke writing this all down, and why is this all happening? And why does Jesus tell them to stop weeping? And Jesus gave them the command to stop weeping because this was not the time to weep. This was the time for them to repent as people. Christ knew he was facing was a necessary part of the redemptive plan of God in their life. It had to be done. It would be done by Christ. He was up for the task of completing the work of God, which was set in motion at the beginning of the world. Christ knew he was sufficient for the work of redemption of sinners, and he was able to complete the task. These people that were watching Christ, this crowd that was watching Christ and listening to his call, they were entertained and unchanged people. There were people that did not respond and see clearly what was happening. They may be curious Maybe critical, maybe they had a cantankerous spirit in them, maybe they're compassionate, but they seem to walk away unchanged by encountering Christ. When we encounter Christ and leave unchanged, that is not ideal. That is a dangerous place to be for your soul. If we walk away from Christ, encountering Christ unchanged, that is a dangerous, damning place to be. But Christ starts and continues to speak prophetic judgment telling them not to worry about themselves, but worry about him, but worry about themselves. And we see in verse 29, For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. We see the call here. We see a consistent Christ preaching God's judgment and repentance. And this is big. In that day and age, to not be able to have children meant you were cursed as a woman in that culture at that time. To not, not be able to bear children was a huge, serious cultural stigma. And Christ says it's better to be a barren woman who's considered a curse, who doesn't have kids to worry about when the Romans come in 40 years, than it is to be a woman who has a bunch of kids who have to worry about her kids' livelihood. Remember, Luke began his gospel account with a very key story about a barren Elizabeth who conceives with John. And he's ending his gospel accounts here with a call that it is better to be barren when God's judgment comes, when they're going to be butchered by Rome. Jesus says, don't wait for me. Don't wait for 
don't, Jesus says, do not weep for one man being wrongfully killed, by their, but, but weep for those when the Romans will destroy the whole city and the whole nation of Israel. I think it's 985 cities are, are ransacked, 100 some thousand people are destroyed, and the women and children get the worst end of this, this attack in 40 some years. Historians tell us just how brutal this nation gets crushed by the Roman Empire. And it's because they rejected God's Son. They rejected Christ. They rejected and missed their Messiah, their Savior. Luke 19, we saw this a few months ago. Luke 19, verses 41, Jesus talks about the coming judgment. Luke 19, 41, he says, When he drew near and saw the city, he, this is Christ, wept over it, saying, What would that you, even you, had known on this day, the things that make for peace? But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days are coming upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. They encountered Christ and they missed Christ. Look at me at verses 30. And they, and they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills cover us. So Jesus is quoting Hosea 10, 8. He changes the word slightly. But the Assyrians is an occupying force in Hosea's time, and they, they decimate the Jewish people. They just ransack them in a very brutal setting. And Jesus is referencing God's judgment on them that will come in A.D. 70 when the Roman Empire destroys hundreds of thousands of their nations, men and women, slaughtering and scattering them everywhere. And it's going to be so bad that they're going to ask for the mountains to fall on them, the hills to cover them. They become suicidal to avoid the destruction and pain of seeing their women and children killed running for their lives. That's what happened in Hosea's day. That's what happened in Christ's saying will happen in their day. And that same phrase you'll see in Revelation 6, 16, at the end of the world as we know it, when our world that rejects Christ, how they respond when they see the coming wrath of God. Revelation 6, 16 uses that same phrase, calling to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. The wrath of the Lamb is Christ. I hope you see the single-minded focusedness of Christ preaching God's judgment and repentance to people. The beginning and middle and end of his time, his ministry here on earth. Look at me at verses 31. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Jesus is quoting a proverb of their day, meaning if this is what happens to an innocent man in times of peace, what do you think will happen to guilty men in times of war? Jesus is likening himself to the green tree in this unbelieving nation of Israel as the dry branch. But there's an invitation of Christ here in this passage. Um, and it, it shifts to judgment first and repentance second. And the crowd did not believe in Christ. They did not respond to the call of Christ to receive forgiveness. Instead, they received wrath because they rejected the judgments of God. The judgment of God is coming for them. And they see it 40 years later. And the judgment of God is coming for all of us, the Bible says. That same warning we see in Luke 19, we see in Luke 21, we see in Luke 23, we see in Revelation 6. That same call of repentance for things are coming that we need to repent of. You see a, a repentant pattern of preaching through Moses' ministry, Noah's ministry, Noah's ministry, the, the Jonah's ministry, the Old Testament prophets. All of them rally around responding to the reality that God is coming. And we need to respond to God now correctly. Paul, in the New Testament, in the epistles, he writes in 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether by good or evil. That is a reality. The judgment seat of Christ is coming for us, church. And we're called to respond now, in light of that day, today. That is the invitation to repent to the declaration of judgment that is coming for us. There's other passages in the Bible that talk about this. It says, by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. How we'll be judged by the word of God, and we'll be judged by what we say. He should not have done that. 
She should not have done that. They should have known better. What were they thinking? By our own judgments on other people, we will be judged by the words we judge others. It says in the Bible that even the thoughts of man will be exposed to the judgments of God. God will judge my thought life, my thoughts. Jesus preached a gospel of judgment and repentance. Christ, there's an invitation to respond to that repentance with forgiveness and mercy, but we have to respond to the judgment of Christ. See, if you don't get that you're guilty, you don't get that you owe God a payment for your debt, you cannot receive the forgiveness of God. You have to admit and see your guilt first before you can accept and see Christ's forgiveness second. In the call of Christ, the gospel, we see a consistent Christ preaching God's judgment of repentance. You're like, Mike, I might dabble in trying to exercise my own call to have people repent and follow Christ. How do I, how do, I do that, Mike? How do I know if they need judgment and, and, and wrath or forgiveness and love? We like to talk about forgiveness and love, but we like to gloss over the judgment and wrath of God. There's this evangelistic strategy to hold on to, to know what you're talking to and how you should talk to people, what's going on in their heart. There's this principle called law to the proud and grace to the humble. And if someone is proud, they're probably running their mouth most likely, telling you all the things they did or didn't do, all the sins they did or didn't commit. And until their mouths are closed, they can't receive the word of God. When our mouths are moving, our ears are closed. When our mouths are closed, our ears are open. And the law of God, the law of the proud, is supposed to humble hearts and men, saying, I don't measure up. I am not a good person. I've broken most of the Ten Commandments, probably all ten if I actually thought about it, and the way Christ talks about it. And then when they're humbled by the word of God, then they can respond with the hope that Christ talks about, forgiveness and love and all that good stuff we all like to talk about. We gloss over the bad to get to the good. Do you love Jesus? Yes. Do I fear God? Many people are like, no, until they realize they should fear God and love Jesus and fear God. Those are key as we share with people the coming 28 days. Look at this verse in Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when, he, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. By grace, you have been saved. You're dead. God saved you. By his grace. You're in the grave? Well, there's grace for you. If you don't admit and understand you're in the grave and you're dead, there's no good news for dead people. You need to realize you're dead. And the only hope and path you have forward is through life in Christ. So my main point today, we see a consistent Christ preaching God's judgment and repentance. And we see the Syrian, the crowd, and the call. So going back to my opening story, my last sermon, before I die. Hopefully it's not today, but if it's today, that's wonderful. I'm fine if, no, that's dark. <laughs> a few weeks, but think about this, a few weeks after your funeral, most people will forget you. I mean, there'll be seasonal times in your life, a birthday, an anniversary, a food that might remind them of you, but a few weeks after you die, most people will not remember you. I'm talking like a year after you die, most people will never talk about you. I'm saying most. You are going to die and face a holy and just God on Judgment Day, your Judgment Day, where the book of life and the, and the book of the Bible will be open and we have to give an account for every thought, word, and deed, public and private, that we did. What is your hope in? Is your hope in your good deeds? Is your hope in the way you were raised? Is your hope in... Your hope has to be in Christ. And you will have no hope in Christ if you do not repent to the coming judgment that is rightfully due us. In today's passage, we see hostility will not save you, curiosity will not save you, sympathy will not save you, only a resounding response to the judgment of God and repentance, surrendering to Christ, your Lord and Savior, will save you. Our call is to preach Christ, church. I know our culture preaches a gospel of ease, a gospel of options, a gospel of, a gospel of comfort, a gospel of entertainment. Christ preached a gospel of repentance. In judgment, and we respond rightly to that judgment by repenting. The Syrian walked behind Christ. It's my prayer that we would be found faithfully walking behind Christ. We walk by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Christ is all in and totally committed to saving you. 
Are you committed to walking with Christ? Are you committed to let everything in your life that is rebellion towards God yield to Christ? Will you please bow your heads and pray with me? Lord, I thank you that you plucked us out of the crowd like Simon. Lord, I thank you that you opened our hearts like you will see next week from the thief and the cross, Lord. I thank you that you gave us the best thing you could give us yourself, Lord. Thank you for your call to repentance in this passage, God. Thank you for the coming judgment that is coming, and thank you that Christ came to save me from the accurate judgment of God. Lord, we, we're completely in desperate need of you, Lord. We have no hope apart from you, God. I ask that you just really help us to be found faithful, even when we are not faithful, even when we mess up the call, even when we're not faithful witnesses to the crowd, even when we don't live the life that we're called to, Lord, you are found faithful in all those areas of our life. We love you and need you, Lord, to direct our steps here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.